Hey y'all, it's your host, Avery Carl. Welcome to the Short Term Show special episode series on Scottsdale, Arizona. So in these 10 episodes, we are gonna take a deep dive into the Scottsdale market, but I wanna note a couple of things for you guys first. So if you are looking for current income numbers and current purchase prices, or you wanna set up a search of Scottsdale properties, You can do that at our website, theshorttermshop.com. You can also connect with us there to get connected with our Scottsdale agents or any of our other markets, any agents in the other markets that we work in. So hope you guys enjoy our Scottsdale mini series and we'll catch you guys later. Be sure to join our Facebook group. It's called Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. Same title as my book. And we'd love to connect with you there as well. Thanks guys, let's go. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Short Term Show special episode series on the Scottsdale market. Today, we're going to talk about building your buying team. So who are the people that you need? How do you find them? What questions do you ask to make sure that they're the right people? So today, we've got our team in Scottsdale, Leslie and Jessica on to help us go over this. Guys, you want to say, hey, real quick, I think people are pretty familiar with you at this point. (laughs) I'm Leslie. I'm one of the agents from the Scottsdale market, like Avery mentioned. I'm happy to help anybody that would like to acquire um, an investment property here alongside Jessica, of course. Um, I am also an investor, so I'm eager to help anybody learn the ropes in the Scottsdale market. All right. Go ahead, Jess. Hi, guys. Jessica Rush. Uh, live just outside of Scottsdale uh, in the East Valley, and I'm excited to be here. I love this this stuff. I'm a real estate nerd um, and love helping the short-term shop clients in, in the Scottsdale area. All right, cool. So let's talk about building your buying team. So there, the first person that you want to start with when you're looking to buy a property in a new market is going to be an agent. And I have a little uh, raw trauma here because I just finished a, uh, got through a situation where I did not follow my own advice on this. I sit here, this is my 18th episode on how to build your buying team. And I say the same thing every time and I still screwed it up myself. So um, I'm going to, hopefully you guys will listen to me better than I listen to myself. So agent. If you're like, okay, I think I want to buy a property in Scottsdale, probably what you're going to do is you're going to hit Google or you're going to go in local Scottsdale short-term rental investment Facebook groups or Arizona ones or uh, local, not just short-term rental investing, but real estate investing groups and say, hey, because you want uh, you, you want to get recommendations from people who have bought in Scottsdale, bought investment properties in Scottsdale before. So that's probably what you're going to do is go on Facebook groups because we go on Facebook for all recommendations now. So uh, you're going to go in there and you're going to ask, hey, does anybody have a realtor recommendation for buying a short-term rental investment in Scottsdale? You're going to get a ton of people recommending people. And here's what you want to ask. So anytime someone sends you a recommendation, you want to say, hey, have you done a transaction with this person before? Did this person help you buy a house? You only want to be taking recommendations from people who've actually worked with that person before because a lot of people are going to have their friends or their family members recommending them because they love them and they want them to have business. But that person isn't always necessarily going to be the best person for the job. So definitely make sure that anybody who recommends somebody say, oh, hey, did they help you buy a house? Did they help you sell a house? Uh, How do you know them? Because a lot of times they'll be like, oh, she's my mom. She's wonderful. And that might not be the right person for you. Um, Also, I would be a little bit wary of agents that are on Facebook all day waving their own flag in all the Facebook groups, because if if they have time to be doing that, they're not out selling houses. So keep that in mind. Not always. I mean, sometimes you just happen to see a Facebook post as an agent, you're scrolling by and you say, hey, yeah, I'm happy to help. I do this, this, and this. But if it's constant, that would be a little bit of a red flag for me. Um, what else? So you, there are a few questions that you want to ask the agent. So let's say you've gotten a few recommendations from other investors who've said, oh yeah, I bought with this person. They were great. You call them up. Uh, I think that a lot of real estate investing podcasts that are more general have said in the past, the the first agent that answers the phone is the agent who gets my business. So Again, I don't think that that really means if anything, if they're the first one to answer the phone, it really just means that they coincidentally happen to not be busy at the time that you called. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the best agent for the job either. So I would make sure that you call a couple 
and ask them questions like, you know, hey, what's your experience in selling short-term rentals in this market? If they've really only sold primary homes and don't really specialize in investments, that can be a little bit of a red flag too, because they might not be, and I hate to use the word red flag. It doesn't mean they're bad at their job. It just means they don't specialize in the thing that you're trying to do. So I would um I would want to know how you know do you specialize in this do you, is this something that you pay attention to because everybody's going to say oh yeah I can sell short term rentals oh yeah I can do this I can do that nobody wants to turn away business so everyone's going to say they can but you need to gauge what their knowledge of the local regulations are I've seen people I've had an agent send me properties and say oh hey this would make a great short term rental and it's not allowed in that building. So you want to make sure that you have somebody who has a firm grasp on the regulations and the types of properties and the locations in that market that make good rentals, not just places that might be the the place that locals in the market want to live, because those two things are different sometimes. Uh, Do you guys have anything to add to that? I mean, I'm kind of blasting through this. Sorry. Yeah, no, I I will say something I've noticed as far as agents who specialize and who don't necessarily specialize. If a agent who doesn't necessarily specialize in short-term rentals lists a property for um, someone, a lot of times on the MLS, it'll say short-term rental friendly. Um, And to us, short-term rental means, you know, one, two, three, four nights. But to them, a lot of agents, it means 30-day minimum. Um, So that's that's a, a, a language barrier, I think, between uh, agents who are and aren't familiar with it. Um, so just because a just because an agent says it's short-term rental friendly doesn't mean that it actually is true short-term rental friendly. Yeah, that's a good catch. I've noticed that too. Great point. I have um I've one term that I see a lot is uh with agents who might get a short-term rental listing but don't really specialize in it, they'll say stuff like rental machine, and it's like a two million dollar <laughs> property that makes seventy thousand dollars a year. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely there's definitely some terms out there that you want to pay attention to. Uh, Okay. Anything else? So you want to get an agent recommendation from other investors who have done deals with them before. You're going to ask some qualifying questions to make sure that this is something that they, anybody can sell a short-term rental. Like my chihuahua on the floor can sell a short-term rental, but you need to know, have knowledge of that and have knowledge of the recommendations. I mean, the recommendations, sorry, the restrictions and the locations, et cetera. Um, Because anybody can sell one, but it's another thing to be actually knowledgeable on the subject. <clears throat> All right. Uh, oh, and also you want to make sure that they live. I know this sounds silly. You want to make sure that since real estate is hyper local, you want to make sure that your agent lives within, you know, driving distance of the market that you're trying to buy in. So we saw during COVID, a lot of people who, you know, might own a property in Scottsdale, but they live in Minnesota, get their real estate license in Arizona and try to sell Arizona properties while living in Minnesota. And that's great. Like you do have a little experience in owning an investment property in this market, but there are certain things about being local that you can't replicate. Like if you are having to drive past a certain street every day on the way to take your kids to school, and you know that that street smells like the dump when the wind blows the wrong way, the Minnesota person is not going to know that because they're not driving by that every single day. And so you might get sold a property that, yes, they were really knowledgeable about managing a short-term rental, but now you've got guests complaining about the dump and there's nothing you can do. So these are the things that only someone who's like truly local can help you with. So definitely keep that in mind. All right. I guess now's the time to move on to lenders. So a lot of this is going to be really, really similar to how to find an agent, except that lenders are not usually hyper local. Lending is typically more national. Uh, A lender who lives in Minnesota can do a deal in Scottsdale, no problem, because lending just isn't that hyper local thing the way being a real estate agent is. But there are, again, a few qualifying questions you want to ask. You you know, you're probably getting recommendations from other investors and you want to make sure that this lender does the type of deals that you want to do in the market that you want to buy in often. So I'm fine with a lender that lives in Minnesota doing my loan in Arizona if they've done, you know, 10 loans in this market before. But if they're brand new and they've never done one there, but they're licensed there because lending is different. You can be licensed in a lot of states if your lending brokerage is licensed in a lot of states, but you might not have ever done a deal in one of them. So 
again, you want to ask and make sure that they've done, because again, they're always going to say, yeah, I can do Arizona, but you want to make sure that they've actually done it before, because there can be things that lenders can get tripped up on, little nuances of the market. It also does help if a listing agent, when I'm a buyer's agent and I make an offer and I send a pre-approval letter to them, it really does help if the listing agent is familiar with the lender, because then they know it's going to be a smooth transaction for their client. So something to think about. Um, anything else on lending? We don't do a lot of condos here, right? Every now and then, but mostly single families. Yeah. Most most clients that come my way are only interested in single family. It's only been like a handful that have been okay or interested or potentially interested in condos. And and it definitely depends on your budget, I think, um, for the market. If you um if you're shopping under four hundred thousand, I'd say you're probably more likely to be looking at condos. Um so I would say that's that's really important when shopping lenders is making sure that they're familiar with um, with condos and the warrantable, non-warrantable and the investment side of things um, as far as condos go. Because um, I know there can be some some um, complications, I guess, there. But um, so, yeah. And I will say when it comes to condos, non-warrantable condos, which if you're buying a property as an investment, most likely the condo building is going to be what's called non-warrantable. So there's a lot of things that will make a condo building be non-warrantable. But in most cases, when it's an investment, it's because most of the condo units are investment properties or second homes rather than single families. So all that means is you cannot get conventional financing on the condo. So no Fanny Freddie, 10% down, 15% down. It's going to have to be a portfolio product, which is totally fine. Now for condos, you do want to find a hyper local lender, like maybe a small bank that operates within that market, within the Phoenix area, because they will be more familiar with the different condo buildings and they're going to know right out of the gate whether it's warrantable or not. What you don't want to do is, you know, get a lender from like the Bank of Idaho and try to buy some buy a condo in Scottsdale. And what they'll say is, well, we'll see, we'll find out if it's warrantable during the con- during the contract period because we have to have the HOA fill out what's called a condo questionnaire. Now, what that does, it's going to take three or four weeks. You're going to be well into the deal before you get that notification that for sure it's non-warrantable. You would rather have a lender who just knows it's non-warrantable up front and treats it that way and gets you through the deal on non-warrantable than have one that's like, oh, well, let's just see. Let's see if we can bang it through as warrantable because more often than not, they're not going to be able to bang it through as warrantable. So when it comes to condos, you definitely want to go hyper-local with, with lenders. Um, we have a whole financing episode later, guys. So you can, we'll definitely hear more about this. But do you guys have anything to add on how to find lenders? I would say one other thing I'm going to point out, um, your agent will have three or four lender recommendations, but I'll let you guys take the floor if you have anything to add. Definitely. I, um, you know, I think a good real estate agent keeps, keeps, um, when you, when you do business, you, you do enough business, you, you keep good people in your circle and you have good people to recommend. I, I would definitely say, call and ask questions and call multiple lenders. Don't just call one agent. Don't just call one lender. Call more than one lender and ask questions. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, Because you're looking for, I think a lot of people just treat lenders as a rate right now, but there's definitely value to be added in the knowledge of the local market. And you may be, when you start shopping for an investment property or house of any kind, you're going to start getting a lot of targeted ads from big national lending companies that that appear to have super low rates. It's happened to me. And when you call them and get through, it's some random person that's just accepting an internet lead that's never necessarily done an investment property of any kind. They're just trying to rope people in with low interest rates. And then in my experience, it doesn't end up being that same interest rate. So you need to ask a lot of questions to make sure before you move forward with any lender. I've worked with some lenders that aren't even familiar with, you know, our state contract laws. That's been a little bit difficult um, just in the contract process. So um, it's, for me, it's really important to, you know, connect with lenders that are familiar with 
Arizona contract law for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've had one of those big box lenders like send me um, a pre-approval, but it wasn't like an Arizona. Yeah. And they're, they're, they don't want to accept it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this doesn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, I don't know if this will be included or not, but um uh, one thing I tell people to ask about is if they're quoting you anything, lenders aren't required to disclose their fees verbally, but they are required to disclose their fees on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but ask, you know, if if they're offering you something that's, you know, looks like a um a, a, a good shiny something, then ask about the fees, ask all the lenders that you talk to. But Totally agree with that. A lot of the big box lenders will, will start targeting you and it can look like a great deal, but a lot of times it's a very inexperienced and not inexperienced in lending, but inexperienced in investment properties um, lender. But there's a handful of great lenders out there who, who can do all these things. I'm going to plug the mortgage shop really quick. Uh, they're very familiar with non-warrantable condos, single families. They know all the ins and outs of short-term rentals, and they've got a lot of great products. It's our sister company. Um, all right. So let's talk about the people that you'll need during the contract. So you found an agent, you found a lender, you found a property, you've made the offer, you're under contract. So let's talk about home inspectors. So home inspectors are typically, in my experience, found through agent recommendations. Your agent will have three or four home inspectors to recommend. You can still get them from other investors, of course. Um, But where I don't want you guys to make a mistake as buyers is saying to your agent, oh, just schedule me whoever you normally use. I don't care. I'll just pay the bill later. So you guys need to, even if you're taking recommendations from your agent and you totally trust them, you guys need to be calling that inspector, asking them questions and hiring them yourself and understanding what all is included in a home inspection in this market. Is pest inspection included? Sometimes that's separate. Sometimes it's different. Uh, is uh, some, some markets, radon inspections are really common. And in some markets, they're not done at all. So we have a whole other other episode on that too. So don't worry, but you need to be calling and making sure you understand what's going on and not just saying, oh, you schedule it. And then I'll look at it later. Because what can happen is I've had this situation before where a client said, oh, I don't care. You just schedule it. So I scheduled it, got it done. They paid, you know, did everything, never really even talked to the inspector. And then it came up a few months after closing that something was missed by the inspector. And then they wanted to come after me for recommending that inspector. So that was my mistake for not saying, here's the inspectors you call. I was trying to like give this really great service and you don't have to do anything. Let me do everything for you. And that bit me in the ass a little bit. So um, guys, make sure whether it's inspectors or contractors or anything, especially calling the city and county for things like restrictions or seeing what's allowed, permitting, always, always, always call the city or county yourself. Don't have your agent do it because even if you've got the best agent in the world, things can get lost in translation. So anytime there's anything big like that, inspections, contractors, restrictions, permitting, really anything, of course you want your agent looped in and and their guidance on things, but always, always call those people yourself to make sure that you don't miss anything. But anything (laughs) else on home inspections? I would completely agree with what you say. And it, it, also, I think, again, and it, it depends on the type of property that you're buying um, to what inspector you end up choosing, you know, and what they're familiar with. So, but. yeah, totally agree with that. All right. And last but not least, let's say you've made it through your home inspection. You're about to close on the property and you've got to find cleaners, handymen, other vendors that you might need for after closing to make sure that you're able to maintain your property. So, again, you're getting these recommendations from your agent should probably have a few. I know we've got a list of them that we give out in Management Monday for all of our markets to all of our clients to give them a head start on cleaners, handymen, et cetera. Uh, contractors, it's got everything on there. So your agent should have a few recommendations, but again, other investors in the market will have recommendations as well. For your cleaners, I would not recommend calling them and and starting to try and hire somebody until you're through all your contingencies. So until basically until you know 100% that you're going to close, inspections come back, you've negotiated that, appraisals come back, that's good. And we're off to the closing table because what you don't want to do is start engaging them too early in the contract. And then something crazy happens in the inspection and they find something crazy and you have to terminate. 
then you've kind of wasted their time. And if you do that a couple of times, because sometimes it can take three or four times before you find the right property, then they might stop. They might not think you're serious. They might not answer your call. So you want to wait until you know <clears throat> what you're closing on. But also, they're not going to typically be able to give you a quote unless they can come look at the property. So just because it's a four bedroom does not mean it's going to be the same price for a clean as all the other four bedrooms in the market. There are nuances such as pools, hot tubs, how many bunk beds do you have? You know, how many different beds are they having to change? Is it four beds or 10 beds? So you want to wait until you know that, and then they can come out and take a look and give you an actual quote. They're probably not going to do that at the beginning of a contract without having seen it. And you're probably not going to be able to get in more than one time to the property during your contract period. You can really only get in during that inspection. And um, that's typically the only time you can get in to, to do anything you need to do is that one time. Um, also with cleaners, you want to ask them questions on, you know, is it is it just you or do you have a team of people? Is it going to be different people every time? What's your process? Do you guys take the laundry offsite or keep or wash it in-house, like in the house while you're cleaning it? I prefer offsite because the longer they have to stay in your house, the less business they can do. And then eventually they might get out of the business. If you lock them into having to do the laundry at your house, they can't turn other properties during that turn window. So I like them to you know, get in there, put the new clean sheets on, take the dirty sheets and dirty towels offsite and wash them on their own time. You want to ask them, do they provide things, the consumables like paper towels, toilet paper, et cetera. So some cleaners will provide all that for you. You don't have to worry about the inventory, but they charge a little more. Some will charge less and they'll just tell you when the inventory is low and you buy more paper towels and send it to them. So ask those questions. Oh, big one. Ask about turns on major holidays. A turn is a check-in, check-out window on the same day. And a lot of times they will not work on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day as they shouldn't. Nope. Like everybody deserves those days off. So you want to make sure before you open your calendar up that you have it set up to where you're not, where you have those days blocked for turns. They either have to check out the day before or the day after so that you're not having to ask your cleaner to do that. I'm seeing a lot of posts on Facebook right now because we're recording this the beginning of December of people saying, oh crap, my cleaner, I have a turn on Thanksgiving day. I have a turn on Christmas day and my cleaner won't do it. Who can help? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be that person. So make sure that that's taken care of and just you know ask them. I think really it's going to be come down more to communication style than the actual job that they do. Because all of their all cleaners' processes are going to be pretty similar, but it's how you guys communicate with each other that will matter. So my first cleaner was not necessarily doing a bad job, but she ran all over me in terms of just taking advantage of me. She would she, the very first guest we had, she knew I was brand new and 26 years old, and she'd been doing this for 25 years. Very first guest called me and screamed at me, how could you ever let these people rent this house? How, why did you let them in here? They've just completely disrespected your property and I'm going to need X amount more dollars to clean this. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What did I do wrong? But yes, here's, here's some more money. And that continued like at least twice a month where she wanted more money and more money and I kept giving it to her. And then finally I caught on and realized they they weren't leaving it trash. I actually went into the property one time before the clean happened and it was spotless. Uh, they did leave a pair of boxer shorts on the floor, but other than that, it was spotless. And then look, here she comes calling me, telling me they trashed it and she needs more money. And so then I ended up having to fire her. And that was my fault for not establishing communication and boundaries at the beginning. I let it happen because I was new. So it's really more about your interaction with them as a person than it is the job that they do. Of course, the job's important, but the communication aspect is just as important. You guys have anything to add to cleaners? No, I think you hit it spot on. <laughs> uh, They're hit and miss. I will say that you you definitely have to weed through the bad ones, unfortunately. Oh yeah, oh, but yeah. that's like any trade. I feel like you need to interview. You need to talk to multiple and get a feel for somebody that you connect with. And even sometimes it doesn't work out after that fact. But um, definitely wouldn't hire the first referral or the first person you find on a Facebook group. Yeah. Well, and you're probably going to end up firing your first cleaner anyway. Yeah. Rarely does that. I would say rarely does the first cleaner last longer than six months. And it's not necessarily their fault. It's a lot of learning curve, a lot of trial and error and, and understanding each other. So it's definitely not uncommon to 
have a second cleaner after about six months. Not always, but it tends to happen. The good news is that there's plenty here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's from. Yeah, they're relatively easy to find. This is a pretty established market. So oh yeah. That's awesome. That's always good to hear. I think a lot of people want to go out and be these like trailblazers in these markets that only have one or two rentals. And then they get in there and they're like, oh, this finding people to help me is not as easy as it is in the markets that have more rentals. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, all right, let's move on to the last person. So your cleaner is the most important par- part of your team. And when you find a good one, invest in them and give them a little extra when they do a really good job and make sure that you give them the tools that they need to be able to do a good job. I've had cleaners call me and I have fired influencers that are short-term rental influencers with a bunch of followers because they were a cheapskate and made it too difficult for them to do a good job and just didn't treat them well. So treat your cleaners like gold because they are, you could not do it without them and make sure that you're not being so cheap that they can't do a good job. If your sheets are stained, you need to buy new ones. You cannot be cheap about that. That is going to show up in your reviews and that is your fault, not your cleaner's fault. So make sure you treat them like the angels that they are and um, make sure that you give them the tools that they need to be successful at their job. And next person that you will probably get as a recommendation from your cleaner is going to be your handy person. These types of of vendors, you're going to need a list of them, like 10. You probably won't be able to find 10, but uh, you need like 10 because it's not like your cleaner where you have a a job for them once a week that they're doing. It's more of an on-call thing and your favorite one might not always be available when something happens. So you need to have a list that you can go through when that thing happens, when the guest leaves the shower curtain outside the bathtub and it floods the bathroom and drips down to the kitchen underneath. It's happened to me, my very first rental. Uh, you need to have more than one person that you can call if somebody can't get over there quickly. And just keep in mind that that being a handy person is kind of a transient industry and that people probably aren't going to be doing that job forever. You see a lot of turnover in that industry, whereas cleaners, they typically do it for a long time. It's a, it's a good gig. A lot of times they'll bring their kids with them in the summertime because they don't have childcare. Totally fine with me, by the way. And um, they typically will do that long term, whereas handyman work, it might be something that they're doing in between jobs for six or seven months or a year or something. So you're going to have a list of like, if you look in Luke's phone and and search handyman in the contract contacts, oh, there's like 300 people for all the different markets that we that we're in. So um, just keep in mind, you're going to need a running list of probably 10 and they're going to charge you for to go out and look at something like a call fee. And then they'll charge you for the job. You want to ask them, hey, do you charge by the job or by the hour? These are things you want to know because it, in some instances, by the hour might work out better, might be a little more cost efficient. In some instances, by the job might be a little more cost efficient. So you want to ask those questions and find out upfront what their fee structure is. Um, But that one, it's a little harder because you're not dealing with them multiple times throughout the week. It's The relationship is different. So just keep that in mind. You need to stack that list as deep as you can. And um, typically you can build out any other more specialized vendors like roof guys, uh, HVAC technicians, things like that from your cleaner and your handy person. Um, Have I missed anybody on the team that you might need? Pool maintenance, kind of same thing. Get them handyman, local Facebook groups from other investors. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. What do you think, Leslie? Landscaper is here for sure. Oh, yeah. oh yes. That's important. <laughs> yeah. Typically, landscape, I mean, in my experience, they're familiar with, um, you know, like the uh, the watering systems and the timers and things like that. So if you have a leak or drip in your irrigation line or something, um, they would be the ones to call to help. I mean, mine fixes literally everything. Um and so it's kind of like a one-stop shop for, for the landscape side, at least. All right. Well, guys, if you're ready to buy a short-term rental with the team in Scottsdale, you can email us at agents at the short-term shop.com and we will get you scheduled. Or if you just want to hang out with us and talk about short-term rentals, you can do that in our Facebook group. It's called Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. Same title as my book right behind me if you're on YouTube. Or we have a live Q&A every Thursday where you can come ask us any questions about short-term rental investing. You can sign up for that at strquestions.com. Thanks, guys. (laughs) 